haven't. All right, so as we go through this course or this class, we're going to come across many, many different theorems. Some, in my opinion, are a little bit more important than others, but nonetheless, we're going to cover quite a few. And this first one, this intermediate value theorem, is kind of what's referred to, bless you, no, or cough, I'm sorry, <laughs> is um, commonly referred to as an existence theorem. And when we go through it, you'll kind of understand why, but this theorem only tells you the existence of a number, like there is some number out there that will work. It doesn't tell you what that number is or how to find that number. It just tells you that it exists. So that's why it's commonly referred to as an existence theorem. There's something out there that'll work, but it's not going to tell you what it is or how to get it. Okay, so what we're going to do first is we're just going to write down what the intermediate value theorem is. We're going to draw a little picture of it to help it make a little sense. And then we'll go through some examples to make it kind of click for us. Do we even know what the, the word intermediate means? That might help us. It's called the intermediate value theorem. Yeah. In between. In between. Okay, so intermediate is uh, kind of the same thing as between two values. Now, I know our district doesn't do this, but maybe you're familiar with some other school districts that have like an elementary school, an intermediate school, and then a high school. Like they don't name it middle or junior high, okay? So the intermediate school is literally between elementary and, and high school, okay? So intermediate means between. So just kind of appease me for a second. We're going to write down the definition or what this theorem means and then we're going to talk about it, okay? I know it's going to do this. It's going to go right over your head, okay? But we're going to talk about it. I just want to make sure we have it down in the notes, okay? So if f of x is continuous, what does that mean again? If it's continuous, either the formal definition we've discussed or kind of the mental definition, how you can think about it. Go ahead, Dan. There's no discontinuities, no holes, jumps, or asymptotes. No holes, no jumps, no asymptotes. You can draw it without lifting up your pencil. Okay, that's the mental definition, how you can think about it. The formal kind of calculus definition, what did that one entail? What we covered last week, yeah. There we go. There must be a point at a value. The limit must exist at that value, like you come in from both sides and then the point and the limit match. AKA you have a bridge, you have a road, and they meet up, okay? So f of x is continuous. Either you can draw without lifting up your pencil or calculus definition, those three things are satisfied, okay? f of x is continuous on a closed interval, a to b, closed meaning we have brackets. You can include the endpoints. So if those two things are true, Oh wait, f of x is continuous on a closed interval, and I forgot the second thing. If you were to plug in a into the f of x function, remember a is just representing some x value. If you were to plug in a into f of x, wouldn't it look like f of a? You know how a is normally a number, like f of three, okay? And, okay, f of a, isn't f of a a y value? If you plug in a, like an x, you get out a y, okay? So if f of a is less than the y variable, which is less than f of b, okay, so we're essentially plugging in the endpoints of this interval to see the y values we get out. Now the thing is, the output from a might not always be less than the output from b, Sometimes they might be switched. So I know this is very informal, but we're going to throw those inequalities the other way. You're just trying to find some y value between the outputs from the interval. Okay, it, this doesn't always have to be true. The output for, from A doesn't always have to be less than the output from B. It could be vice versa. 
So that's why we're switching the, the inequalities. Okay, very informal the way that's written, but I hope that kind of makes sense. It can be either way. So if those two things are true, if f of x is continuous and there is some y value between the outputs from the interval, then there exists, okay, it's called an existence theorem. There's telling you that something is there, they're just not telling you what it is or how to find it. Okay, there exists at least one value. Maybe we'll say that x value is c between a and b such that if you were to plug in that x value of c into the f function, you would get out that variable of y, which is in between the f of a and f of b. Was I right? Right? Yeah? So, some of you might get it. Okay, more power to you if you get it. But I'm assuming... Yeah? Okay. So we're gonna draw we're gonna draw a little picture to make this make sense. So that's why I left this this empty space over here. So what I want you to do, draw a first quadrant graph. We're gonna label our closed interval on terms of the x-axis. We'll go from A to B. If you were to plug in A into whatever equation they give us, maybe you get out this point. So therefore the y value from that point would be f of a, okay, your output. When you plug in b into the function, maybe you get out that point. So then the y value would be f of b. Does that make sense? You plug in a x, you get out a y, you can plot the point, okay? Now one of the conditions or stipulations is that f of x is continuous. So you have to connect those dots with no holes, no jumps, no asymptotes. I don't care how you connect them, okay? But you have to connect them nonetheless. So maybe I'll do that. Okay, no holes, no jumps, no asymptotes. So notice how we're continuous, okay? So that's the first stipulation. Okay. We also know, okay, some, for some reason, that there is some y value between the outputs. So maybe I'll put that y value here. You can put it wherever you want, as long as it's in between f of a and f of b. So our graph is continuous, and we know that there is some y value between the two outputs. If those two things are true, okay, if those two things are true, then there is at least one x value c between a and b, such that if you were to plug in c, you would get out y. Okay, check this out. If I know the y value is here, then that means I'm located right here graphically, correct? If I just go across that, that y value. And if I'm at this point graphically in terms of the y-axis, then I must be located here in terms of the x-axis, right? This is that value of c. And isn't the value of c between a and b? Right? This would work if I chose a different y value. Maybe I did something a little lower. If I trace it to the graph, I will always land between a and b. Right? Intermediate value theorem. You will always land between the a beginning value and the b ending value. As long as you're continuous, right? 
and the y value you pick is between the two outputs. What if I were to pick a, a y value up here? Would I land between A and B? No. Okay, so these two things must be happening. They're the conditions. Okay, you have to be continuous and you have to have a y value between the outputs. If those two things are true, your x value will always land between A and B. Do we see that? Does that make more sense now that we have a picture? Okay, definition, <whistles> picture, good. Okay, so what we're going to try to do is based off some graphs, we need to first determine does this intermediate value theorem hold? Okay, does it apply? If it does, maybe we can answer a few more questions. If it doesn't, then we're not going to worry about it because how can you use something if it doesn't even apply in the first place? Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, first graph. They're actually the same graph. We're just going to take a look at two different intervals to see the difference here. So the first one's asking us, is there a value for C, okay, like an X value, between negative 5 and 2, such that if you were to plug in C, you would get out a Y value of 2. Okay, it's asking us, is there a point? Does something exist? Okay, so let's go ahead and analyze this. We're looking at the interval from negative 5 to 2. Maybe you can identify that graphically. So we're between those two brackets. And if we want a Y value of 2, we'll look across the graph in that respect. Do you notice how that Y equals 2 does intersect the graph somewhere right there on the left hand side? And if you were to trace that point down, would you land between negative 5 and 2 like we labeled? Okay, so the question is, is there a value? We'll say yes, and we'll say it happens to be, or C is between, it looks like negative 4 and negative 5. Excuse me. Okay. So since we have the graph, we can visually see that there is a value. But let's say that we didn't have the graph. Okay, this is why we have the theorem. If we don't have a picture, we can use the theorem to help us. Does the intermediate value theorem guarantee a value of C such that the Y value is 2 on that interval? Okay, let's say you didn't have that graph. Okay, we're going to see, do, is there exactly at least one point? Okay, does it guarantee it? So in order to answer that question, we have to determine, does the theorem apply? Okay, which means we have to check those two conditions. Is f of x continuous? And is that y value of 2 between the outputs for the function? Okay, so let's start with the first criteria. Is f of x continuous? Maybe you can look at the graph to help you out. Okay, that's probably the, sh the shortcut way. Go ahead, Dan. <coughs> Bless you. Um, I looked up in the uh, top two equations, and it's yep. a greater than negative two and a less than negative two, which uh -huh. there is no uh, actual point between. Okay. So take think about the calculus definition of continuity. Again, maybe we'll pretend we don't have the graph. We would have to check to see, does the point exist, does the limit exist, and do the point and the limit match? When you take a look at your piecewise function, okay, the only issue that's really popping up is at that x value of negative 2 because that's where one graph ends and the one graph begins. We have to make sure that they meet up because if they don't, you're going to have a jump, graphically speaking. But neither one of those domain constraints has a bar underneath it. So that means the point doesn't exist. That fails our first criteria for continuity. So in terms of evaluating the theorem, okay, does the theorem apply? We would say no because f of x is not continuous at the x value of negative 2. 
And why is that negative 2 an issue? Why is the fact that the point doesn't exist an issue at negative 2? Yeah. Why is that an issue? Mm -hmm. Like if, if this answer was 7, would it still be an issue? Does it matter that we're not continuous at 7? Why does it matter we're not continuous at negative 2? Yeah. Because the uh, interval negative 5 to 2 is part has mm -hmm. two in it. Okay. It's all about that interval. Okay. You're concerned with that beginning point and ending point. Notice how negative 2 is in the interval that you're analyzing. So if it's not continuous there, that is an issue. So no, the theorem doesn't apply because f of x is not continuous at negative 2. And this is within the interval. For example, if we found it was not continuous at 7, that doesn't really matter because we're only going from negative 5 to 2. Why do we care what's going on at 7? Okay, so you have to be kind of aware of that interval. What are you focusing on? And is there anything in there that's causing a jump, a hole, or an asymptote? Okay, anything that's uh, discontinuous. So even though there is a value for C, like we can tell graphically, we are not guaranteed that there is one. Okay, there's a difference. There is one, but we're not guaranteed it. We're trying to figure out, for instance, the intermediate value theorem, are we guaranteed? Should there be a value? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But can we be guaranteed that there is one there? Okay, let's check this one out. Same graph, okay, same equation. This time, we're switching up the interval from negative 1 to 5. We're still looking at that x value of 2. Is there a value for c, okay, between negative 1 and 5, such that your y value is 2? No. I mean, the only c value that we found was over here on the left-hand side, but there's absolutely nothing within the interval that we're focused on. So we can say no. So that's nice graphically. Okay, we can visualize that on a picture. But let's say we didn't have the graph. Okay, so this is when we're going to analyze the theorem. Does the intermediate value theorem apply? Are you guaranteed a value? We already know the answer is no. Okay, but let's try to check out why. You have to determine does the theorem apply? Are you continuous from negative 1 to 5? Okay, can you draw it without lifting up your pencil? And then the second kicker is is that y value between the outputs if you were to plug in the negative 1 and 5? So let's analyze the two conditions. If you're analyzing continuity, specifically from negative 1 to 5, notice how you're only looking at the second equation. Okay, we're going to pretend there's no graph. You're just looking at the equations. Negative 1 to 5 is contained within that domain, right? Okay. If you were to draw that equation, would you have any holes, jumps, or asymptotes? No, because it's a line. Okay. So continuous check. Okay, we know that. But the second criteria is that this y value of 2 is between the outputs of negative 1 and 5. So if you were to plug in negative 1 into that equation, what would we get out? What would your output be? If you plugged in negative 1? Yeah. Negative 1 and a half. Negative a half, okay. And if you were to plug in the other interval value of 5 into that equation, let's see, negative 5 and a half minus 1. Be negative six and a half? Yes. Negative six and a half? Okay. So is the y value of two that you're analyzing between the y values from the interval? Is two between negative a half and negative six point five? No. Okay, so remember there's two conditions. It has to be continuous 
and the y value has to be between the outputs. So even though this one fit the first criteria of continuity, it does not fit the second. Okay, so we would say no, we're not guaranteed that value. Yeah? Um, wouldn't f of 5 be negative 3.5? Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just did negative 5 minus 1 and then did the negative 1 half to get negative 6 and a half. Correct. I saw, I saw the eyes again. You know how I said how something's going on when I look at you guys? I saw them again. Was that what, what was happening? Okay. Thanks. Negative 3 and a half. Okay. But regardless, right? 2, thanks, Dan. But 2 is still not in between those values. Okay? So, no, even if we didn't have the graph, okay, the intermediate value theorem is telling us that we are not guaranteed a value because 2 is not between negative 1 half and negative 3.5. So looking at a graph is easy because you can kind of section off the graph, draw your little y value, see if it lines up anywhere. But without the graph, that's when a little bit more analysis is needed. And that's what we're going to focus on. Okay? Are we okay with what the intermediate value theorem is telling us, what it represents, what we're finding? Okay? Let's go ahead and try uh, some without the graph. All right, just to reiterate, what two conditions must be true in order for you to use the intermediate value theorem, in order for it to apply? Two things must be true. If one of them is not, then you, you can't use it. What do you think, jo Joseph? Continuous. Continuous, okay, so f of x is continuous. On the interval, it might be discontinuous somewhere else, but as long as it's continuous on the interval that you're looking with or looking at, you're fine. Okay, so we must be continuous on the interval. Yeah. Uh, F of C equals Y. Okay. But that Y also has to be between uh, mm -hmm. F of A and all right, so if f of c, if you plug in c and you get out a y value, that y value must be between the outputs from the interval. So we'll say y is between, that's why it's called the intermediate value theorem. Okay, you're be between something. You're between f of a and f of b. Those two things have to be true. If one of them is not, then we are not guaranteed a value. So we have to check those first. Okay, so let's take a look at number one. We have to analyze, is it continuous? Is there any possibility for a hole, a jump, or an asymptote? And then maybe we'll check out the endpoints. Okay, but let's start with continuity first. If you were to think about the graph of x minus 3 over x plus 2, can you think of a place where there might be a hole, might be a jump, might be an asymptote? Anything we got to check? Yeah. How'd you get negative two? Okay, so x equals negative two is an issue because it makes the bottom zero, correct? And if the bottom is zero, it's either going to result in a number over zero or zero over zero, right? So graphically speaking, we know we either have an asymptote or a hole, but either of those are points of discontinuity anyway, right? You could plug in negative 2 up top, which would give you negative 5. So we know it's a vertical asymptote because we get a number over 0, but at least we can analyze that there's something going on at negative 2. So we know that negative 2 is an issue. We have a point of discontinuity. The, the kicker is, though, is that negative 2 location an issue? Is that in the interval that you are analyzing? No, because our interval is negative 1 to 3. So, yes, this is a point of discontinuity. There's a vertical asymptote there. But it's not an issue because we're not concerned with that location. So we'll say f of x 
is continuous on the interval. We found that there might be an issue, but after looking at the interval, we realize it's not. So that's a little tricky. Okay, so the first criteria is met. We're continuous on the interval. We now have to check out that this y value of two-thirds that we want is in between the outputs from the interval beginning and ending points. So we're going to take that beginning x value of negative 1 and plug it into our function, see what our output would be. We get negative 4. Okay. Let's go ahead and plug in 3, the other interval value. We get zero. Okay. So is two thirds between negative four and zero? No. So even though we satisfied the first criteria of continuity, we are not satisfying the second criteria of this in betweenness. The y value has to be in between the outputs. So does the intermediate value theorem apply? Are you guaranteed a value? No. There might be one. Okay, there might be one, but we are not guaranteed it. Okay, we do not know for sure that there is one or isn't one. So we'll say no. Um, maybe IVT for short, intermediate value theorem. No, the IVT does not apply on the interval from negative one to three. because, okay, they want us to state why or why not, what do you want to say? Your justification is going to be one of these two things. Either it's not continuous or you don't have that in-betweenness going on. Yeah? Because two-thirds is not between negative 4 and 0. Works for me. We did okay? No graph. Okay, we're just analyzing the function. Let's go ahead and check out 2. It's the same equation. This time we're changing up the interval though, okay, and it's the same y value. So the same point of discontinuity uh, is an, might be an issue, okay, x cannot equal negative 2. Same vertical asymptote. It was not an issue in the first example, but we're switching up the interval. Is it an issue for this second one? Is negative 2 within the interval from negative 4 to 1? Yeah, okay. So f of x is not continuous or discontinuous, whatever you want to say, at the x value of negative 2. Which is in the interval. So we already failed the first criteria. We don't even have to check the endpoints. I don't really care if we plug in negative 4, if we plug in 1 and what we get out. I don't care if 2 thirds happens to be in between those. Okay? What I care about is that we failed the first criteria. f of x is continuous, so don't even worry about anything else. So we can say no. The intermediate value theorem does not apply because your reason, your justification is going to be one of those two criteria. Maybe we'll say f of x is not continuous 
on the interval from negative one to four, or negative four to one. Are we hanging in there? All right, let's go ahead and try the bottom one. All right, is P of X continuous? This one might be a little tricky, but think about in your head, would you be able to draw that without lifting up your pencil? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Huh? What do you think? Why? Uh, I, don't see I mean, you, you got a 50-50 shot, yes or no, but why? Go ahead. There's no discontinuities at the end. Okay, so the only way you would have a hole or a jump is if you had a fraction, right? Because you need something over zero. There's no fraction going on there. And the only way you have a jump is technically in piecewise functions because one equation is ending or beginning at different spots. And this is not a piecewise function that we would have to check. So you maybe you can think about it that way. The other thing you can think about is we have an exponential function, which we went over before. You either have exponential growth, exponential decay, some variation of that if we start flipping it. Okay, have all those reflections. And then cosine is that wave, right? So if you could draw an exponential function without picking up your pencil, and you were to draw a wave without picking up your pencil, if you multiplied somehow those two functions together, you should be able to draw that graph without lifting up your pencil. Make sense? If you combined them like that? Okay. So this one is continuous. We'll say P of X is continuous on the interval. So the first criteria checks out. which means we have to check the endpoints. Now we're dealing with trig and a base of E exponential. So if you have a calculator to get a decimal value, might be good to check it. Let's check the endpoints. If we were to plug in negative two into our function, we'd have E to the zero times cosine of negative two if you were to evaluate that on your calculator, we're dealing with trig, make sure you're in radian mode. Those of you in physics might have a hard time, you have to go back and forth, because I, th I think you use degree in there. Any takers? Yeah? E to the zero is one, but what about cosine of negative two? Are you in radian mode? Oh, that's around one. The answer is one. Are you sure? I think. I am in radian mode. I got negative 0.416. Radian mode? Okay. Oh. I mean, if you typed in e to the zero, it shouldn't matter because that's, sorry, I'm in that's okay. Mode, apparently. Yep. Negative point four one six. Let's check out the output from the other interval value. We're going to plug in one. So we got e to the three times cosine of one. We get 10.852. Sound right? Okay. So let's check this out now that we know the endpoints. Is the y value of 5 that we want to evaluate graphically between the y values from the endpoints? I think so, right? Okay. So satisfied the first condition of continuity, satisfied the second condition of that betweenness. So the intermediate value theorem does apply. 
So what's this telling us? Okay, we are guaranteed some value for C, okay, an X value of C, such that if we were to plug in that number into this equation, we would get out five. We are guaranteed that there's at least one number. There could be more than one. So what we're gonna do is actually try to figure out this number. So we're gonna take that Y value of five and plug it in for the P of X, AKA Y location. Five equals E to the X plus two times cosine of X. We're gonna use this equation to help us figure out that X value for C. Okay, what is that special X number between negative two and one that would give us an answer of five? Now, when I look at this one, or this equation we have here, it's not really uh, nice to solve by hand, right? So we're gonna use our calculator to help us with this. We're gonna uh, find an intersection point on our calculator. Are we familiar with how to find intersection points on a calculator? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, make sure you have a graphing one. If you wanna grab one, you can. Okay, but we're gonna actually use the calculator to find that value for x. So if we're going to graph these, we're gonna to have to go to the y equals spot on the top left hand side. And if you have anything in there, just go ahead and clear them out. We're gonna type in five into y1. That's just signifying your first equation or the first graph you wanna see. And then in y2, we're gonna type in the actual function or the other side of the equation. Now your E button is, let's see, right here next to the natural log, but do you see how it's blue? You have to hit the blue second button first. And in that power spot, we'll type in X plus two. To get out of the power spot, you have to arrow to the right to bring the cursor back down. And we'll finish typing in cosine of X. Are we okay with typing those in? Okay, before we hit graph, let's go ahead and change our window so we can clearly see the intersection of these two uh, lines or these two graphs. Now, for the x min and x max, we're simply gonna use the interval that they give us because that's signifying the lowest x and the highest x that we're concerned with. So we'll type in negative two to one. And then the X scale is whatever you want the tick marks to represent, like what do you want to count by? So you can count by ones, you can count by halves, you can count by really whatever you feel comfortable with. The Y values on the other hand, we're gonna go ahead and use those outputs because we know exactly the lowest Y and highest Y that we're concerned with. So negative 0.416 and 10.852. If you want to round those to like negative one or 11 whole numbers, you could do that as well. And then your Y scales, whatever you want to count by. Okay, so this graph is gonna look very similar to the one we drew at the beginning when we uh, first introduced the intermediate value theorem. We have that beginning output on the left, the ending output on the right, and there's that value of five that we were looking for. I think we drew a dotted line on our graph. So what we're gonna to try to do is figure out that intersection point, which would eventually give us the X value that we're looking for. So we're gonna find the intersection. Do we know how to do that on a calculator? For some of us that are familiar, can, can you help us out? Like in terms of the buttons, how it works. Good, Braden? Okay. Calc. Calc. Okay, so we're going to go to this calculate menu, which is right above the trace button. It's blue, so you have to hit the blue button first. And we're going to choose option five. See how it says intersect? So go ahead and hit enter on option five. Your little cursor or spider dude will pop up. And I want you to move him her, it, uh, to where you think the intersection is located. 
and we're simply going to hit enter three times. So after the third time, the intersection word should pop up, and notice how you have exactly that y value of 5 at this x location. So x is negative 0.333, you could say 4 if you wanted to round it. We'll normally go to three decimal places in here. So you can either chop it off after the third decimal or you can round to that third decimal. Okay, so we were guaranteed an x value between negative 2 and 1, and notice how our answer is between negative 2 and 1, by this intermediate value theorem. Because not only were we continuous, but the y value we were searching for was between the outputs from the interval. You are guaranteed at least one, okay? Do we realize that there might be more than one? Couldn't you have more than one intersection point on that graph? It might happen, There's okay? Four. But you're guaranteed at least one, okay, on that interval. We doing okay? There's four intersection points on that graph. On the whole graph, maybe, but yes. just on that interval, we only wanted yeah, one. There's only one on that interval. Exactly. All right, maybe try some of the homework tonight. We got two more very similar examples tomorrow to check out, but that's about it for this section. Okay, intermediate value theorem, what are the conditions, when does it apply? We have to be familiar with those criteria.